life has has uh, thrown me this salad and I'm going to try to take the, the best of the insights of that salad and deliver it this morning. Uh, so pray for me. <laughs> One of the things going on in my head is what I'm studying in school. Some of you know I'm back in school part-time and we're, we're studying this semester interreligious education. I'm doing practical theology, religious education, we're doing interreligious education <laughs> as if all of that weren't egg-headed enough. And so now we're focused on uh, learning dialogue. And so that takes place in the context of how do we seek peace and justice among diverse peoples of different faith, but goodwill. And so the question then that I've been wrestling with or I'm learning, learning about is how we might begin to reach out to and touch not in a way of, of seeking to change them, but in a way to value and include them other. We tend to otherize. Do you know what I mean by that? This is us, that's you. This is we, that's the other. We do this a lot, and I'm using the term we. We are a distinct entity as opposed to they. We're the local church, they are the conference. You know, this sort of otherizing that we do, failing to realize that we are them and they are us, right? And this is really true in many, many, many ways. That's maybe one of the most important things that I could say to you this morning is that we are they and they are us. Because there's one thing that I know that's true when I read scripture and when I think about who God is and when I think about what it means to be created. One thing that I know, and you know it too, it's not difficult. One truth, what is it? That all of us were made by God. Created by God. Do you believe that this morning? I do too, with all my heart. All of us have been created by God, and therefore, who do we all belong to? And who are we all loved by? And who has God given himself to and for? All of us. So we are they, and they are us. And so my head's just full of themes around uh, God's many children and how we bring about peace and hope and justice in a world so full of strife, given our differences and every group's tendency to otherize. Another thing going on in my head is recent uh, conferences I've been to. Last week I was at the Adventist Forum in Glendale, and the discussion was soteriology and nonviolence, and let me break that down for you very quickly. What that was about was how do we think about what it means to be saved and theology surrounding the doctrine of salvation in terms of nonviolence. Because if we think about it, uh, some of our theology centers around a tremendously violent act being done to the Son of God as a means of saving us. And so this was a, a really a mind-bending sort of conference to think about how nonviolence and, and salvation theories and theologies might come together. And so that's doing in the back of my brain. This week, I had the privilege of sitting down with our religious liberty director at the Union, Alan Reinock, and uh, some of his cohorts and some of my colleagues at the Southern California Conference. And we, we started to lay out the foundations and groundwork for a peace and justice conference next year in which we'll invite the community, in which we'll look at ways in which the Seventh-day Adventist Church can speak to and partner with the larger community. Last evening, I had the privilege of attending a screening of uh, Room Enough Around the Table, which some of you may be familiar with, dealing with the question of how it is that we as churches might uh, fulfill the gospel in relationship to the LGBT uh, plus community. Uh, very interesting. I'll be doing, yeah. So that's in my, my head in the discussion that followed. And then I come to the text and I realize that the text deals with so many of the same issues back then that we're dealing with now, maybe not in detail, maybe not in specific but the same kinds of challenges of us versus them, of otherizing, of failing to recognize what the core meaning of, of 
religion is, what it's really about. You see, the idol that we tend to make is we make an idol of ideology. That's the first one that we're tempted to. And right now in our country, we're divided in the worst possible ways, not around fact, not around truth, but around ideology. We're divided, we've, we, we've, we're divided, yes, we have differences of opinion about policy and governance, about the military and spending, about all kinds of things in our country, and yet the tone isn't set on a debate about those things that are mutually important to us. The debate centers, rather, on vitriol and uh, politically charged language meant to further divide and separate us one from the other. I fear that the church sometimes is following in that same vein. Some of you, very few of you probably, have been following what's been happening at the General Conference. And I've written a little bit of that in my letter. Basically, once again, we're dealing with the question of equality of women when it comes to service and ministry. And the Pacific Union has long been a proponent of having women in ministry and treating them equally as such. But there's a movement in the world based on the last General Conference action not to give divisions the independence to choose to ordain who they might. There's a movement on the part of the World Church to try to bring these errant unions, namely the Pacific Union, the Potomac Union, and the Mid-America Union, into compliance and harmony with what they consider to be policy under a new rubric of unity. And so once again, the church is following the world, not in terms of bringing women into ministry or not in terms of equal pay for equal work or equal recognition for equal work, but following the world in terms of the divisive sort of pieces that we're focused on. And our text is a great corrective for that as well. So let's just take a look at a couple of the things you've heard read to you so well this morning already. If we look at our psalm, this is a famous one, 119, you know it all, and you know it well. We memorized, many of us as children, parts of Psalm 199. The law is perfect, delighting the eyes. You are righteous, Lord, and your laws are right. And you've laid down statutes in righteousness, and they are trustworthy. I love this. My zeal wears me out, for my enemies ignore your words. Your promises have been thoroughly tested, and your servant loves them. Though now I'm lonely and despised, I don't forget your precepts. Here's a person who is filled with zeal for the law, but also the enforcement of the law against those he perceives as other and enemy. And they continue not to comply. He's worn out in his efforts against them, and yet they seem to go on just fine. Why do my enemies prosper? We find those words in other parts of Scripture. He loves the law, and he seeks to keep it, but in this conflict that he's in, in this life that he's living in, which he's trying to do good, and the enemies of goodness continue to oppose him, in this state, he finds himself depressed, lowly and despised. And yet even in this state of being beaten down, he forgets not God's laws. Your righteousness, O Lord, is everlasting, and your law is true. Even if trouble and distress comes to me, your commands give me delight. Your statutes are always righteous and they give me understanding. Now, we don't usually think of law the same way. I had to watch very carefully for the highway patrol on the way up here. I saw two of them in time, thankfully. It gives me no delight to go 55 or 65 miles an hour. I take no delight in that law and many others, I suppose. And I know many of you don't either. Now, the challenge is, of course, what law is it that, that it is being spoken of here in, in Psalms? You see, what we tend to think of is codes and rules. What we tend to think of is 
legal matters and proceedings, what we tend to think about is that which forces us into some kind of compliance, that which we're under, that which we're controlled by. Right? No? Yes. How many of you initially, just right off the bat, when, they say, it's, when I say, it's the law, have a positive impression of that? You know? It really, it's, oh, good, it's the law, great. Okay. What if I told you that it was the law that we had to drown every fifth puppy that was born in the United States? It's the law. Are you excited? No, of course not. There's nothing righteous about that law. It's possible for law not to be righteous. So when we're talking about the law that the text is talking about, we're talking about the righteousness of God which is based not just in a word that goes out, but a word that is productive. That is to say, a word that brings about right doing. We tend to be overly focused as a people on words of right doing rather than implementing right doing. And we tend to be over-theological as a people. That is to say, we fight about these things theologically as if they were really central and really important. We tend to fight all of our battles theologically. We tend to be very much in our heads, and we're very concerned as a people, aren't we, about right thinking, right believing. We've emphasized it for so long and so heavily that sometimes we forget that it's really about right doing. Orthopraxy, not orthodoxy. You see, one of the things we know about setting up habits and patterns in our brain is that we need to commit to repetition. Any of you who have a habit know that this is the case. The habit is self-reinforcing, yes? So if you have a habit of crawling out of bed and crawling to the coffee machine and turning it on and pouring yourself a cup of coffee, if that is your habit in the morning, every time you do that in the morning, it's self-reinforcing. Right? I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing. I'm just saying it's self-reinforcing. We develop habits by doing something over and over and over again until it becomes part of a routine or something we don't even have to think about. Right? We, we, we know what we need to do sometimes, disconnected from habits, but if we deliberately choose certain things, we can develop habits that lead to right doing, right? Right? We can set up habits that are about right doing. So there's a sense in which what we do becomes actually the basis for changes in how we think and changes in how we we live. I've experienced sickness, as some of you know, in the last year in surgery, and the doctor has told me I've got to lose 25 more pounds. What have I done in the time since I've had that surgery? I've yo-yoed up and down plus or minus four pounds. In other words, even though I know that my health is on the line and maybe my life is on the line, I have such deeply embedded bad habits that I'm so committed to that it's very difficult to find a way to do the right thing. See, the truth is that when a doctor tells you you've got to quit smoking or give up your alcohol or you've got to uh, lose 25 pounds, you need to eat differently, you need to start eating green stuff and you've never liked green stuff, whatever the doctor's told you, you've now got to walk a couple miles a day or, or try to exercise vigorously three times a week, most of us would rather die than do it. Oh, I'm serious. Presented with life-altering or life-ending complications medically, Studies show that only 6% of Americans are willing to make the changes to live. Everybody else chooses to die. Now, they will not say they're choosing to die, but they won't pursue the kinds of health options and actions that will lead to the life they say they want. And I believe that that is so often the case 
just in the human dilemma in general, and it carries over into our Christianity. We say we want to be like God. We want to be like Jesus. We want to do right, and yet our habits go against that in so many ways. And one of our quickest things to do is to otherize. That's not us. That's them. That's not me. That's you. When we get to Habakkuk, and Habakkuk's an interesting book, by the way. Do you mind if I make a comment or two on Habakkuk? I have a study Bible, and if you have one, you can readily see what I'm talking about. Habakkuk was a contemporary of Jeremiah. For those of you who know that, I'm sorry. I just, just want to give it a context. And Jeremiah and Habakkuk and some others who are contemporaries in those that, at that time are concerned about the impending Babylonian invasion. They know it's coming politically. They can read what's happening in the political life of the nation and the strife that's going on. They've heard the rumors and the word, and they're concerned. And Habakkuk writes this dialogue with God. It's almost like a diary, a challenge. He, he asks God these questions and then gets these answers, and it's written in this beautiful way, but it's not written privately. It's written, written as something to be presented to the people of Israel. Habakkuk's first complaint is, why does the evil in Judah go unpunished? In other words, why is it, God, that you don't fix our problems internally? And God's answer? The Babylonians are going to punish you. Habakkuk's second question or complaint then is, how can you, God, be just and use a group that is less righteous than we are to fix our problems? I want you to think about that for just a minute. In terms of what I said a minute ago. If you were a nurse at a hospital and the male nurses could be called registered nurses, but the female nurses could only be called certified nurses. How long do you think that would be tolerated in the business and public sphere? Two minutes? Long enough for a suit to be filed? And yet the people of God are on a global level debating whether we can call a female minister who's been who's had hands laid upon her, commissioned or ordained. The church isn't leading the world in righteousness. The church is being taught by the world how to be righteous. Our country, not particularly Christian, already gets the principle of equality before God as creatures. We have yet to embrace that fully. Strong words, I know, but true. So then Habakkuk's question, how can a just God use the wicked Babylonians to punish Israel, gets answered by God in this. You have to understand, Habakkuk, that when they are done punishing you, I'm going to punish them. We don't have to worry about the wickedness of other. God is the judge who will take care of all. And finally, Habakkuk prays and says, and and asks God for manifestations of both wrath and mercy as he's seen in the past and closes with a a confession of trust and joy in the Lord in chapter 3. So here we are in, in Habakkuk and we have this famous, famous Uh, uh, set of words, right? How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you don't listen? How long will you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate what's going on? Destruction and violence are everywhere. There's strife and conflict. And the law is paralyzed and justice never wins. The wicked him and the righteous so that justice is even perverted. 
I will stand watch. I will look to see what he will say to me. And the Lord says this. Write down this and make it plain on tablets so that it may be heralded. For the revelation awaits an appointed time and it will not prove false. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are on, aren't upright. And here's the phrase. But the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. That last phrase is one we've all memorized. But the righteous shall live by faith. Have you heard it before? Yep. Memorized it before? Said it before? Here we are with this wonderful, wonderful words. And the context is Habakkuk. This, this struggle with good and evil, with right doing, and with questions about a God who lets things go the way they are. Our second reading has a very pithy line as well that we all know and memorize. Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. You probably learned that text too, right? Memorized it, have said it. The context of that is Isaiah's words in the mouth of God. And you've got to think about this for just a second. How boldly written is this? How brave is Isaiah to take on an entire religious system, and I mean an entire religious system, and call it disgusting in the name of the Lord? That's pretty powerful. The entire sacrificial system, he says, along with all that's happening in the tabernacle, the temple, is annoying and disgusting to God, is the way Isaiah is putting it. And what's the issue? The issue is that Israel is focused on the ceremonies and symbols of righteousness. Israel is focused on the forms and getting the routines and rituals right. They're focused on the sacrifice as a means for taking away their sins, and they're failing to live up to what God is asking them to do, which is very straightforward. Do what you know to be right. Seek justice. Love mercy. Walk humbly. Take care of widows. Look after orphans. Do right in your land. Don't use people. Don't take advantage. It's not complicated. Don't otherize the unfortunate. Don't otherize the alien in your gates. Don't otherize. In fact, they all are part of my Sabbath rest. Do you remember that in the commandment? Neither your servant, nor your sons, nor your daughters, nor the stranger in your gates. All part of God's Sabbath rest. The commandment is inclusive. But Israel had become exclusive. And their sins were as scarlet. When we get to the New Testament reading in Thessalonians. And there was just a couple more verses there that I wanted tended to. So let's turn to Thessalonians 1. I want to focus on verse 3 starting off. We ought to always thank God for you brothers and sisters and rightly so. And here's why it's right to thank God for these brothers and sisters. One, because the faith is increasing number one, and the love you have for one another is increasing. What does that look like? Love is increasing. The community has become a better place to be. Faith is increasing, and God commends them. Paul commends them. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and your faith in all the trials and everything you're enduring. The context doesn't matter, being the community of love and faith and holding to that matters. Here's what I wanted included was 11 and 12. With this in mind, we constantly pray for you that our God may make you worthy of his calling and that by his power he may bring to fruition your every desire for goodness and your every good deed prompted by faith. We pray this so that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and you in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you hear it? 
every good deed prompted by faith. A righteousness is not about the political holes we climb down or our capacity to differentiate ourselves from another. Our righteousness isn't based on our correctness in our thinking or theology. Our righteousness is not based on an ideology. It's based in the goodness and grace of Jesus Christ, first of all, and our status as his children and creatures of all. And secondly, it's based in doing those straightforward, simple things that he asks us to do. Love one another as I have loved you. Thank you.